Globalism is the policy of placing the interests of the entire world above those of individual nations. Those in the Federation. It had one leader, okay, over all of it, and then representatives from each planet. And in the TV show, it was wonderful. It worked wonderfully, okay? Um, on a much smaller scale tonight, our topic is globalism. <laughs> globalism. And, and while I could not find the word federation in any definitions of globalism, uh, the definition of it is actually very close to what I just read to you from the, the Star Trek show. And, and here, here, just to, to start us off, here are a few definitions of globalism, and I'll end with one that's probably the simplest of them all, but here, here are a few definitions of what globalism is. Glo globalism is the ideology of a worldwide market system, justice system, and religious system that will transmit a government that will benefit everyone. No, you don't have to write that one down. I got, I got a shorter one for you in a minute. Here's, here's, here's actually the shortest one, but I don't think it's the best one. Here's another definition. It's the operation or planning of economic and foreign policy on a global basis. But actually, as we get into this, it's, it's actually more than that, uh, the, the world's view of it is anyway. And then here's the one, if you, if you want to write one down, you don't have to, but um, a national policy of treating the whole world as a proper sphere for political influence. Nope, that's not the one I wanted you to write down. <laughs> okay, scratch that one off. Scratch that one off. Here's the one I want you to write down, and this is actually from dictionary.com. I didn't, I didn't highlight these right. That's what messed me up, all right? Globalism is the policy of placing the interests of the entire world above those of individual nations. All right, that, that's, that, that's, that's how the dictionary defines globalism. I'll, I'll say it again. The policy of placing the interests of the entire world above those of individual nations. Now, does that sound bad? D did any of these definitions sound bad? Bob? Why would they put the world the well, it's not a federation of planets. That's just Star Trek, Bob. <laughs> we're talking globalism here now. We're talking globalism. The, 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 we're, we're back to reality for a minute, Bob. All right, um, but did, did any of these definitions actually sound bad? In fact, that last one that I gave you actually sounded biblical. Uh, Philippians 2.4 says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So here's, here's the question. Here's a question for you. And you don't have to, an well, maybe I will have you answer it. Is God in favor of or opposed to globalism? What do you think? Is God in favor of or opposed to globalism? All right. Yeah. <laughs> I got, depends on what kind of government. Yes. And what did you say, Richard? All right. All right. It, 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 there's a... There is a, it really depends on if it's a, a man-made globalism or a God-made globalism. And, and there is a huge difference between the two. It was kind of a, a quick, or a, excuse, a, a trick question, all right? It was quick, too, but anyway. Um, globalism is kind of a, a, a hot topic today. It is a contemporary issue that I think uh, does demand a, a, a godly response to it, a godly response from us to it. And um, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll start out tonight. Here, here's the first of our, our four-point outline, okay? The world's view. 
Uh, the world's view of globalism, and I'm just going by the definitions that, that I, I gave you here a minute ago, but the world's view of globalism is it can benefit everyone. It can benefit everyone. Many in the world, ver many very powerful people in the world proclaim that globalism, it, 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 it's something that, that can be a good thing. A, a, they don't use the word blessing, but, but a good thing for everyone. In fact, one of the definitions that I gave you is that it's the ideology of a worldwide market system, justice system, and religious system that will transmit a government that will benefit everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think so. Uh, you know, we'll... I'll just say it right now, you know, there, even before we get to the biblical aspect of things, but um, I don't know how you can unify a globe when you can't even unify a, a country or a state or a county or a city or a church family or a family family, a nuclear family, okay? So, and, and obviously there's a lot that plays into that, sin being the number one thing, but in the world's view, in the world's view, um, it benefits everybody. And while there, there are a lot of intricacies that, that we could look at tonight, we're gonna look at this really in, in rather broad terms uh, because there are those who only look at the, the trade aspect of globalism. There are those that, that are only looking at the economic aspect of globalism, okay? There are some that are, that are focused on the environmental aspect of globalism or the, or the social aspect and some even the religious aspect. So there, there's a lot of things that we could look at, but we're gonna look at it in, in rather broad terms tonight and uh, know too that there are many in the world that are, that are also very opposed to globalism for those very things I just mentioned because it, it does talk, it, does influ it can influence trade or economy. You know, there are people that are opposed to it too, but the world, as a, a good portion of the world, their view is it's something that can benefit everyone and therefore the world's response a good portion of the world's response is to pursue it. This is something that we need. We need to make happen for the good of everyone. And we're seeing that in our world today in a number of ways. And I'm just going to list a couple of them really quickly. Uh, the United Nations. Um, the United Nations is an international organization. It was founded in 1945. It was right after the Second World War. And I think most of the nations of the country, after that terrible, terrible war, wanting that war to be the war that ends all wars, they formed this UN, all right, this United Nations. And um, really, their purpose, in fact, right from their mission statement, there's about 51 countries involved committed to, the maintain, to maintaining international peace, security, developing friendly relations among nations, and promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. World War II what was tragic. And, and the world at that point in time, 1945, they wanted that war to be the war that ended all wars. So I, I think that's, that's why the United Nations came to be. It has four main purposes. To keep peace throughout the world, to develop friendly relations among nations, to help nations work together to improve the lives of, of poor people, conquer hunger, disease, illiteracy, and to encourage respect for each other's rights and freedoms. And then uh, lastly, to, to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nation, nations to achieve all of those above goals. 
It has a, a president. It has representatives from the nations of the world. So there's one organization that we see was set up to pursue um, globalism. Another one is the World Health Organization, uh, who is directing and coordinating, the correcting, uh, coordinating authority on international health within the United Nations system. Okay, so it's actually part of the United Nations. It adheres to, to their, their mission statement and everything. Of course, their vision, whose vision, is of a world in which all peoples attain the highest possible level of health, and their mission is to keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. And then the last organization I'll, I'll mention, because these are, I think, probably, probably the three biggest um, organizations that are heading up this pursuit of, of globalization. Uh, the third one is the World Economic Forum. And it is based in, in Switzerland. Um, its mission is cited as committed to improving the state of the world by engaging business, political, academic, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. So there, there, are many, there are many other organizations that I could mention, movements that I could mention, but these are probably some of the key ones in this, this pursuit of globalism. Now, as I read to you those mission statements and, and vision statements, did any of them sound bad? No, they, they, they sound really good. They, they really do, they sound good. And um, by going by the, the vision and mission statements that these global organizations hold, uh, proclaim, um, globalization actually seems like it could be the, the answer to world government problems, financial problems, health problems, uh, among other things. So the world's response is, we need to pursue this. This is the mission. This is, I, I share that vision, people say. Well, here's something to think about, and this is where we're going to get into the, the biblical aspect of this in a minute. But know that 1945, which was the founding of the UN, 1948, which was the founding of WHO, and 1971, which was the founding of the World Economic Forum, uh, these were not the first time the world population has sought to unify, all right, um, for the betterment of everybody. In fact, I'll just read it to you again. I read it to you when we began this, this series. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10 says, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. There is, there is, is there, questions, is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? Well, he answers the question. It's already been in ancient times before us. So, let's look at some attempts at globalism. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, and I'm going to just read you a couple of beginning verses here. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, they had, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city 
and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, in just reading those first four verses, does that sound bad? Doesn't sound bad at all. Um, it actually sounds good. But then, God comes along and ruins it all. Verses 5 through 9. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down there and, and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from, from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and there, from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. All right, so just be, beginning here in verse 1, how was the world socially united? All right, by, by they all spoke this, the same language. Um, any other way they were socially united? We're all one family. Okay, all one family. Right now we're socially distancing. All right, but what's the opposite of social distance? All right, they're all in one place. All right, so the world was united socially. How are they united economically? Okay, yeah, let's, let's build a city. In fact, they, they were making bricks. They, they developed an industry and uh, were building a city and a tower. How were they united religiously? That one's a little less direct. All right, that, that's, the, we've, yeah, that, that's part of it. I heard something else. Ah, all right, yeah. We're going to make a name for ourselves. And religion really is just a, a, a practice, okay? But uh, that, was, that was the goal of, of their practice, was to, to make a name for themselves. It was all about them. It was about exalting man. And when man pursues the exaltation of man, um, there is no boundary that he won't cross to attain it. And, and that's really what verse 6 is telling us there. Okay, when man pursues the exaltation of man, there's no stopping him. There, there's no, no boundary he won't cross to attain it. Now, we don't read it in these verses, but what is the big deal with them uniting or staying united as they were. Okay, it's in direct disobedience to what God told actually Noah, I believe, in the first verse of chapter nine. So let's let's turn there. Nine one. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And of course, that was to Noah's sons. And of course, his descendants would be the one that were supposed to, under the command of God, fill the earth. All right. So they didn't do that. What did God tell Noah and his descendants to do? Fill it. What did they do? They stayed put. They stayed put. Not many generations after Noah said these, uh, or excuse me, uh, after Noah, these, these people, the generations after Noah, basically said, never mind the filling of the earth, let's stay together. Ne never mind the obeying of God, let's make a, a name for ourselves. And how did God squelch the Genesis 11 globalism? Okay. 
confusing their languages. What was the place then called? Babel. Babel. And uh, it is where we actually get our English word to describe incoherent language now. Uh, but it was also the, the future site of, of Babylon. Babel became Babylon. So while globalism may sound good, while the world will think it benefits everyone, um, we see here, even though the world thinks it'll benefit, even though they're pursuing it, here's the biblical view. The biblical view is man-made globalism always becomes wicked. It's always going to be defiant of God. Uh, Man-made globalism always becomes wicked. We need to turn to the book of Daniel now. The book of Daniel. Last prophet book right before the, the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 2. And let me read to you. We're just going to kind of set this story up. I'm going to read more than what I actually need to for my point here, but I, I want to get this, this uh, account set up for us here. So Daniel chapter 2. Let me read to you verses 1 through 5. It says there, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream. And my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. All right, now I'm going to stop there. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of, of Babylon, okay, the Babylonian Empire, actually. And right here, we're back to, to Babel again. Now, what do empires seek to do? Take over the world, right? They, they, they want to control the world. They did actually, empires are typically a... a a, uh, a means of, of globalism, but typically in a, in a conquering type of way. So here we are, right back at Babel again. But just to get us started, what is the king's demand of, of these counselors, magicians, and sorcerers? Okay, tell them the dream and then interpret it, all right? Um, th that they... They wanted, they, he wanted them to tell them a dream and its interpretation, basically saying, I don't want you to tell me what you think I want to hear. All right? If I tell you the dream, you can turn that into something you think I want to hear. The king didn't want that. I want the truth, and none of them could do it. But then the king, as we progress here, heard about Daniel and, and called for him. Now, interestingly enough, Daniel is in Babylon and in connection to what we're going through Sunday mornings in Jeremiah, okay, Daniel is actually part of the very first people in Jerusalem that got exiled to Babylon. Well, here he is now, okay, and he's brought before King Nebuchadnezzar and um, uh, he, tells, he tells the king that by God's power, by God's power, I, I will not only tell you what your dream was, but I'll, I'll interpret it for you. And he does so in verses 31 through 41. He says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, 
stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, or it's cut out without hands, which struck the image on its, on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like shaft from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, this is the dream. Now I will, we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, and it shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush the others. All right, and I think, all right, one more verse here. Whereas you saw the feet, toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Now, there is a lot that we could talk about concerning this prophecy, okay, this dream and interpretation and truly a prophecy of, of the future. But we're going to focus on the, the globalism aspect of it tonight. Um, the dream, well, I'll ask you, what is, what, is, what is the dream of? Not the interpretation, but the dream. What, is, what did he see? Okay, a massive image of what? It's a person, a man with a head of gold, right? Chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, feet of, of iron and clay. But, it, but it's a, a person, all right? Um, what's the interpretation? Kingdoms, all right. Different kingdoms that would rise up conquer the one before it. Okay, so all these things are, again, pointing to globalism, the, these empires, and here we are. It's happening at Babel again, and, and what is being exalted? What is the statue of? A man, okay. A man, once again, exalted at Babel. How, how do we know he's being exalted, this man? What, was there anything said in the passage that, what's that? All right, all right. Yeah, it, I don't know how tall it was, but verse 31 gives a pretty awesome, exalting description, doesn't it? So it, it's the exalting of man. How does each empire take over the other? Like crushing it, right? Conquering it. Um, does, any, does everyone benefit from these worldly empires? Okay, <laughs> all right. So just a, an example. I mean, what we're seeing, uh, globalism here, uh, people don't benefit from it, all right? And, and it's always, globalism always becomes wicked. Um, let's look at the, there's actually a, a fifth kingdom um, and it's referenced here by the one that's made of iron and clay. And again, we won't go into all the, all the details of that. 
but we learn quite a bit more about this fifth kingdom in Revelation chapter 13. So let's turn there. Beginning in verse 1. Revelation 13, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read quite a few verses here just to, again, just to, to get the, the picture. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and this is, of course, the Apostle John, and he's, he's getting a, a vision of, of the future, actually our future yet. What we're going to read here has not happened in the world yet. Then I, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on its horns ten crowns, and on its heads, uh, its heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. In verse 12, we learned that, or chapter 12, we learned, by the way, the dragon is, is the devil, okay? But the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, uh, the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all his authority to the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. Now, um, let me just make sure. All right, we need to go to verse 14 and verse 8 yet because it continues there and there's one more important thing we need to see. Chapter 14 and verse 8. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, 
a, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So chapter 13 is describing this globalization. But where again is the headquarters? Babylon again. Babylon again. Okay, another, something about Babylon and, and globalization here, okay? But... Uh, there is nothing new under the sun. So any, any, anything that we're seeing in our world globalization-wise, um, it has happened before um, in the book in End Times. The headquarters, again, is going to be Babylon. But does, does any, any, everyone benefit from this empire in Revelation? Who doesn't? Huh? Man, there's one in particular group yeah, <laughs> that benefits the least, right? Be believers, believers. And, and quite frankly, every single time that uh, globalism takes place, um, it's, it's the believers that are kind of left on, on the outs. Um, they don't benefit from it. All right, so... This final empire actually will be a, a true global empire with a government ruled by a man known as the Antichrist, also called the Beast, um, also known as the Lawless One from other places in Scripture. He will have authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And he, along with the false prophet, will force all people to take the mark and once again build an image that exalts man. All right, so the future global leader will control all financial transactions, all religious observance, and refusal to worship the, the Antichrist. The beast means um, death. So it doesn't benefit everyone. So let's bring this back to right now um, and the world's pursuit of, of globalism. Um, some might call it the, the New World Order, okay? That's a term that's been around a, a little while. But there is, as Ecclesiastes says, nothing new under the sun. Uh, what we're seeing in the New World Order, it, it's happened before many times, and it's always ended up wicked, Okay, that, that's, that's the, the biblical view. It's always been, man-made globalism always becomes wicked because it exalts man over God. It will fail. Uh, 1945, the UN was established, was designed to, to keep peace throughout the world. How's it done so far? Com a complete failure. It exalts man over God. Um, it exalts the powerful over the weak. Another example, the World Economic Forum. That is made up of a couple thousand of the richest people on the planet, and they get to decide how the economy is going to work for, for everybody else. I wonder if it will be in their favor. It, it, another thing about man-made globalism is it forces compromise of, of biblical principles. Um, if, if you want to belong to this global community, you need to adhere to our standards over your standards. And it is not beneficial to everyone. Uh, truth be known, it, it's, it's detrimental any kind of, of man-made globalism is going to be detrimental to everyone. So since we're in Revelation 14, look at verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself also... Uh, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength 
into the cup of his indignation. And I don't need to go on any further, okay? It, it is any kind of man-made globalism is going to be detrimental to everyone. So the biblical response, and we're, we'll probably wrap up just a little bit early tonight, but the biblical response, and I, I've got three things for you. I think the biblical response is to oppose um, man-made globalism. Um, how? how? How might you and I oppose man-made globalism? I've got all night. <laughs> no, I mean, does something come to mind? What, how might we take a stand against man-made globalism? Can we, can we really stand against it or just stand for Christ? Like, I don't know that, can we protest globalism? Well, I... I, or, I or just continue uh, to live a Christ-centered life? Right, yeah, I, I think I think that's that's the key, living a Christ-centered life. But we are to stand against the wiles of the devil, and it's by, according to Ephesians six, putting on the armor of God and 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 going to war with the the sword of God. Okay, so we we can oppose it by promoting God's globalism. All right. Um, I think the first way to do that really would probably be, number one is us submitting to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we can't do it in our power. That's what got man-made globalism into, into the trouble, is they're doing it. They're exalting man and doing it by their power. We have to do what we do by the power of the Spirit. Um, John chapter 14 John 14, 26 and 27 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So it's by the power of the Spirit that, that we can oppose a man-made globalism. And uh, 2 Thessalonians, interesting passage, talking, I, I believe, about the Spirit. We can turn there for a minute. Second Thessalonians, in chapter 2, verse 7, says... For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one uh, earlier in the chapter talks about that, that antichrist, okay? And, and great evidence, great evidence points to this restrainer in, in this chapter 2, verse 7, being the Holy Spirit. And it is by his power that the lawless one has not already uh, set up the final man-made global empire. So we, you and I, we need to submit to the power of the Spirit. We can't do this on our own. Um, uh, just leave it at that. We need to stand fast in the faith. Not only do we stand against the wiles of the devil, but we stand fast in the faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verses 13 and 14. It says this. 1 Corinthians 16. Verses 13 and 14. It says. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do. Be done with love. So it is our. Our 
Well, I'll just ask you, what, what, are, what are some things involved or what does standing fast in the faith entail according to those two verses? It says it starts off with watch, right? What are we watching for? Any idea? Okay, yeah, I just, uh, uh, there are antichrists, false teachers in the world, and we need to be watchful of those false teachings as compared to God's word. How do we be brave and strong? Okay, yeah, standing firm in the faith. Um, would it be brave to proclaim Christ even though it may become outlawed? That would be brave. Being strong, not denouncing Christ even in the face of, of persecution and, and doing it all in, in love, with the, displaying the love of Christ as we do it. That's, that's standing fast in the faith and, of course, sharing the faith going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Um, we, need to, uh, we need to oppose man-made globalism. That's the first thing I wanted to point out. We do that by submission to the Holy Spirit, standing fast in the faith, sharing the faith. We need to also anticipate um, God-made globalism. Um, is God in favor of or opposed to globalism? Opposed to man-made, in favor of God-made. And there, there is a time coming when globalism, God's globalism, will be here. Um, there's a night and day difference between man-made and God-made. Um, one exalts man, the other exalts God. One exalts power over the weak, the other gives power to the weak. One forces compromise of godly principles. The other is based upon godly principles. One benefits no one. The other benefits everyone. God-made globalism does benefit everyone that is part of it. Um, just in closing, there's one last reason, I guess, maybe to uh, oppose globalism uh, maybe that's not even the right way to put it. Um, but uh, it is God who established the nations. Um, he, he, didn't, he didn't, since the Tower of Babel, actually since Adam and Eve, the command was to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. It wasn't, his intent was never a, well, maybe with Adam and Eve, it was a, a, globalize, a globalization under, under his rule. But uh, sin ruined that. And every time globalism has been attempted by man since, it has ended up um, in wickedness and, and benefiting no one. But there is a time coming when God will establish his globalism, but until that point in time, he is the one that has established nations. Um, let, me, let me read this passage. You don't have to turn there, but Acts 17, 26 and 27. It says, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Now, I, I just read that verse to you, but according to that verse, what, what's one of the reasons that God has established the nations? Ah, yeah. So that they would seek the Lord. That's right. Um, why might a nation be more likely than a whole globe to seek the Lord? I mean, nations of people are typically established by like-minded people, aren't they? 
And I, I think that, that might be part of it. You know, until all the nations of the earth are, are like-minded about God, globalism, globalism is, isn't going to work. Um, but right now, each nation can play a part in uh, a perfect global community that God is building right now, okay? He's, uh, he's establishing right now those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. This world is not our home. We, we are citizens of heaven. He is, he is building a, a global kingdom from people of, of every nation right now. But anyway, that, that is where I'm going to end tonight. Um, the key being man-made globalism will always end up in wickedness, and the only kind of globalism that will ever work is... Uh, is a God-made globalism. But any, any thoughts or questions on what we've looked at tonight? Eula. Just a thought, and I, I wonder daily, sometimes more than once, if our nation's leaders have never read the Bible. You see, I don't even wonder that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, I, yeah, I would say the majority of the nation's leaders. Because Christian is seems to pass away from two praying for yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think the majority of the nation's leaders have not read the Bible, and even if they, well, they have no intention to, they don't want us to either. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And, you know, then after they finished that, then the North Koreans attacked South Korea after they drove them into the sea. Yeah. And it hasn't stopped. And then it went into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Stalin was killing millions of people. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the gospel is the key in all of this. It, it is the key. It's, it's the only thing that is going to uh, at least bring a, a degree of unity in this world. Cindy, did you have something? No, we, would, we wouldn't be well-liked, right? But that's okay. Yes, right. That's okay, yeah. Right, right. Sure. Yeah. Right. All right. Anything else?
And that's why people hate it when you pull out a thing, is because they do it for free. Their free stuff goes away. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Lord willing, when we come back, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, I think that's December 2nd, we will look at something different. (laughs) I'm trying to remember. It may actually be politics, okay? It may actually be politics, but again, like globalism in a rather uh, general sense. But uh, anyway, uh, let's close in prayer tonight. Father in heaven, um, thank you for tonight. Uh, We do thank you that regardless of how grim our world and our nation may look, uh, regardless of how... uh, divisive and ununified and zero harmony that we have on our planet. Lord, there is a time coming when it will all be perfect. And we thank you that we have that hope. Uh, Thank you that you are a good God, a good ruler. You're our Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.